Well, thank you very much, Alison, for inviting me to give this talk and to Bayside Council and for your introduction to country. Um, it, the, the title and the, uh, the theme uh, are di dictated in part by the fact that I have only 20 minutes to speak. I shall try to keep this within 20 minutes and I'm happy to be cut off at that point. Um, but the, the, the subject matter, we've now gone through two slides, by the way, so we Oops. need to go back one. Um, the subject matter is the Cooks River, uh, and it, I've, I've been, it's been necessary for me to focus on a couple of key themes. I was, because of the time limits, I was once asked, what are the really big things that happened to the Cooks River? And of course, I, was, I felt that everything was important that I've written about in my book, River Dreams. Nevertheless, when, when faced with this question, I just out of the blue nominated two things, um, the, the dam and the airport. And, and the, the questioner kind of agreed with that, that this, these were very big things that happened to it. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. The Cooks River was not named until 1798, uh, but it was explored by Cook and his men uh, during the, the, the visit in 1770 to Botany Bay. Uh, and since the 19, uh, since the, uh, 1798, it's been called, it was called Cooks River in the way that it is on the screen with the apostrophe. Since the 1970s, it's been called the Cooks River. It's still a, a European, indeed, a sort of colonial name. Uh, an Aboriginal name has not been forthcoming, although the term Goliare, the place of the pelican, has been suggested, but there is not agreement among Aboriginal people to accept that name, um, uh, possibly because uh, a number of different uh, clans did inhabit the area of the Cooks River Valley, particularly the Gadigal, which I'm most familiar with, and the Wongo uh, upstream but others as well, the Bedigal and the Gamagal as well. Now, the book does deal with a lot of different things, including the aesthetics of the environmental transformation of the Cooks River. But uh, in this talk, I just want to, emphasize, to, to mention as a kind of overview that the European-Australian approach to the Cooks River was a combination of instrumentalism, perhaps I should have said utilitarianism, and aesthetic appreciation. The river was to be used for water, for animals and even humans. It was to supplement Sydney's water supply that was actually dammed, or it didn't work. But it was also appreciated for its beauty. And there's always been this tension between the two in the history of the European occupation of the Cooks River Valley. But it was also, uh, but, um, but the latter, the, the, the appreciation for its beauty tend to come off second best. Okay, next, next please. Next, okay. So to enhance the supply of water for the colony, the river was dammed in 1839-40 using convict labor and giant sandstone blocks, which had to be hauled into place by pr very primitive means. Um, this was the first great change to the river and it was done to an augment Sydney's water supply. It was during a, during a great drought. Um, now this, this action had ecological and hy hydro hydrological effects. Um, especially it eliminated the upstream tides, destroying the remaining uh, mangroves that had already been badly damaged and, and removed for uh, Europeans wanting to make soap after burning the, 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 uh, the, the, the branches. Uh, and it impeded fish stock movement. So it, it was ruinous to upstream fishing at the time. Pollution and siltation increased above and below the dam. This is very significant because the river was itself a river that did was quite muddy and it did naturally accumulate a, a fair amount of uh, siltation. But this increased dramatically in the 19th century due to urbanization, but when it got to the dam, which was built in 1839-40, couldn't go any further. And moreover, downstream, the uh, flow of the river was affected as well, and that because there was no tidal movement uh, or very or limited tidal, more limited tidal movement. Pollution also uh, accumulated, especially above the dam, but also below the dam, and, and flooding, very bad flooding. Uh, ironically, the water was not suitable for human drinking purposes, although it was used for a time for animals on the farms around there. This was because the um, sandstone blocks that were in place as the dam uh, actually let quite a lot of the salt water through. Next slide, please. Next. Okay. Now, so the dam didn't work the way it was supposed to. In fact, it, it just uh, 
exaggerated flooding on the river. It didn't provide the right supply of, of water that was required and so on and so forth, and it increased the uh, accumulation of pollution. So the dam was modified in the 1860s, but more so in 1897, 1898, as you'll see in the coming illustrations. But it was actually not taken down until the 1960s, despite what you will read on some of the plaques along the river. Next, please. Samuel Eliard did this watercolour of the Cooks River at the Tempe Dam in 1866. And uh, this is quite an idyllic representation, but when you see, there is a photograph that's similar for the same position, and it shows very, it's very similar. Uh, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't an inaccurate representation, really. Uh, and you can, what you're looking at there on the, in the lower part of it is the dam, where the dam has gone over the river. That's then become a, a highway, or a road, anyway, across the bridge. It was actually a toll road. And on the right-hand side of the bridge, on the right-hand side of the entrance to the bridge, uh, at the bottom, you can see the, um, uh, the toll booth. Uh, I think you should go further to your left to find this. I, I don't have control of that, but you'll see the little uh, little toll. Uh, that's it there, yeah, right. Now, just to the right of that, you'll see that there have been some uh, holes put in the dam. That's a, um, sluices to allow the water to flow through. And that's because the dam just wasn't working the way it was supposed to, to work and flooding was extreme. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting that this picture makes the river look very placid and quiet above the dam, very very uh, mirror-like. And actually that was quite true. And that's because um, there was no tidal flow. It was the main thing that was to, to keep the Cooks River alive. So it was very still. And frequently the, the uh, reports on the, on, the, on the river upstream, you know, emphasized how still it was. Um, but that wasn't good for the river because it meant it, it, it meant that the, the silt flowing downstream could only go as far as the dam. Okay, next one. Next. Okay, so in 1897, 1898, there was a big change and this bridge was put over the Cooks River, a proper bridge, above the dam, standing on stilts. Uh, not a very good, um, a bit of overexposed this uh, slide, but you can see the actual bridge there. Trams went across that. Um, it was a Fairly narrow bridge, two-lane bridge, uh, not like the current six-lane bridge. Below that, sluice gates were put in, which had to be manually occupied. And you can see each of those. And one of those is actually broken because this was take this picture was taken during the 1946 floods and 90, or through to the 1948 floods in that period. There was just tremendous floods, and that damaged these uh, sluice gates. They didn't, they didn't work very well. They were quite inadequate, but they did lead uh, to some mitigation of the flood issue. So you can see that um, that's, that's, um, that's the effects of uh, attempts to modify the dam. Now, if we can, that was 1897, 1898. Can we have the next one, please? Next. Okay, now this is just a map, uh, which is a representation of what the uh, vegetation landscape was like uh, at the time of European settlement, taken from Doug uh, Benson's book on the uh, Cooks River vegetation. And uh, uh, if you can, it's hard, but you can probably see, you can see the outline on the right hand side of the uh, current airport. Uh, if you go south, yeah, you can see the runways extending off into the bay. Uh, and if you go just up a little bit, and you'll see the serpentine reach, and then there's a kind of uh, rectangle, a little rectangular stretch of, uh, yeah, there. And that was where the first um, uh, rect rectification work was done to try to relieve the siltation problem. And just a little bit upstream from there, if we go around up the river there a little bit, that's what, uh, back, back, that's where the dam is, or was, right there, right here, right here where the, uh, yeah, right, there, no, so further south, further, further to the, further, yeah, there, that's right. Okay, so that's the actual situation of the dam and the current Princess Highway. Uh, and you can see all the tributaries of the river there as well. Um, now, if we go on to the next one. Um, okay, now, what I just, because of the, this being done for Bayside Council, I wanted to emphasize that a large part of what is now the Cook River completely forgets about and excludes, as did the previous map, the existence of what I call the eastern catchment of the river. And this um, um, uh, geological uh, sketch. Um, uh, comes out to do with uh, the, what, what has become Sydney Water uh, up as the authority. Uh, uh, all of the uh, all of the parts north of the river that are 
that are, have a, 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 a that don't aren't aren't etched in. That is what I would call the eastern catchment. This whole area it goes up as far as Centennial Park, and so it, it uh, encompasses Randwick part of Randwick Council, and down through uh, through the current golf course and to near the entrance of the entrance of the river, um, and. Uh, to the uh, west of that, or to the east, on the uh, uh, illustration that you're looking at, you can see Alexandra and Waterloo, uh, which are which are also part of this area. So all of that was alluvial and blown sand, and water flowing through it down to what is now the mill stream. Now that area was part of the Cook River Valley. It's no longer considered part of it. It's it's a, a subject of considerable historical amnesia. The people who lived in the Botany region knew about the Cooks River. That was their river. Uh, and um, they uh, have, those people who are old enough to remember it, going there, going through that area uh, of botany, they also they have strong memories of it. Um, and we go on to the next one. Um, and this uh, from 80, uh, on the maps, it says it's a, in, in, in a uh, atlas of Sydney, it says 1886, 1888 rather. It's actually 1886 because it doesn't have the new work that was being done in the 1886-1888 period to uh, relieve siltation on the Lower River. But again, you can see very clearly the stream coming from the east in near the mouth of the Cooks River. Um, to the uh, west of that, or to the uh, left-hand side on your slide, you can see West Botany, which is now known as Rockdale, um, and the rest, and, bo and, bo and Botany on the right-hand side of that. Um, and up in the left-hand corner, there is Shays Creek, which was becoming uh, in the next couple of years after that uh, the Alexandra Canal, uh, as it is today, the most polluted waterway in the whole Cooks River system. Right, let's go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the Cooks River in the 19th century well, it did have some utilitarian functions, but it was also a place of attachment. People did like the river. It was a, it, it was considered a lovely place despite the problems that were accumulating it. It was a place for fishing, swimming, boating, and all kinds of recreational activities, yachting, and so forth, so forth. Please go on to the next, please. Okay, so for example, Puck's Wharf in Botany in 1926. This, uh, this picture um, is um, uh, in the area covered by the airport now. Uh, so in the period of the late 19th century and early 20th century, Young people would come here and swim. This is on the north side of the river in Botany. Uh, now, the interesting thing is to me is that in 1927, a bridge was put at exactly this point over to the south side and through to Kaima and on to Brighton and the Sands in that area there. So there was a bridge put down the following year. And when that happened, the, um, the swimmers used to dive off that bridge into the river, which was said to be shark infested as well. They were bull sharks in the river and uh, people didn't seem to worry too much about it. I didn't see any reports of uh, people being taken by sharks in the river at that time. Um, can we go on to the next one? Okay, and this is taken from upstream, but there was a, a huge amount of boating downstream as well. And this is a very uh, wonderful image of uh, the kind of Edwardian period in which um, uh, the, the residents of the Cooks River Valley would take their picnics on the riverside and uh, would go boating on the river. I talk quite a lot, a lot about this in my book, River Dreams. Uh, so that uh, there were 110 um, boats that could be hired at the Tempe boat shed um, uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. So there could be a lot of craft on the river. A long time since then that the craft have been absent and they're coming back at this time. Let's go on to the next one. Next. Uh, swimming was very popular, and uh, indeed it was um, mainly males, or almost exclusively males as far as I know, and uh, it was uh, nude swimming. Was, and this is not just a, a representation, this is actually what did happen, at least the part that there were, that there were young boys would come down, strip off the clothes, go in the river, much to the shock and uh, horror of the ladies who were swimming, who were, uh, sorry, um, boating by uh, on their craft. Um, Sidney Long, the, the, the painter, painted this by Tranquil Waters in 1894, and it's in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. It's not on display as far as I know at the moment, but I actually have seen it on display. And you'll see in the foreground, you'll see uh, uh, Pan, the mythical figure, 
is uh, actually uh, piping uh, uh, a kind of temptation, as, as it were, to the boys to enter the water. So, so swimming was a was a big activity in the nineteenth century, uh, Cook's River, and um, it was so despite growing pollution problems. And uh, but it also this picture reveals the kind of Arcadian landscape idea that the Cook's River was a place of pastoral beauty, um, which was ap appropriate, an aesthetically pleasing landscape, which I talk a lot about in the book. On to the next one. Next. Now contrast that image with the 1950s to 1990s, where we have images like this in the newspaper. Uh, the sun's a river of death. This is the result of a cyanide uh, discharge uh, upstream uh, in which um, many, many tens of thousands of fish were destroyed and the river was uh, rendered uninhabitable. <laughs> um, go on to the next one. And downstream pollution greatly affected the river too. And this is uh, Muddy, Muddy Creek near Vestic Street, a uh, picture of pollution in 1991. So from the 1950s uh, to the 1990s was probably the nadir of the Cooks River as far as a place for boating, for uh, certainly for swimming uh, and for fishing. In fact, fishing was banned for a long time in the Cooks River Valley from 1951 until, uh, may even still be banned, but certainly banned until recently. Um, next one. The faults of the dam and the subsequent buildup of pollution induced other big changes to remedy the flaws in the building of the dam on this small river. The most obvious was the channelizing of the river, which was designed to convey pollution away. Uh, and to, to keep the river flowing in conjunction with the introduction of the sluice gates, as I showed in an earlier illustration. And, and this profoundly altered the river's aesthetics and turned it into a kind of industrial landscape, a kind of drain. Uh, so if we can go to the next uh, slide, please. Next. So here we see Campsie upstream, the riverbank around 1900. Still an amazingly large amount of, uh, of original indigenous vegetation on the river at that time. And you can see people um, paddling in the stream uh, at that point in the sort of middle section of that uh, picture. Uh, but now contrast that with the later picture of the same area. So this is the modern uh, upstream uh, Cooks River. It's been channelized and it's been made to look like a drain. And that affected people's um, appreciation of the river. Now, mind you, a lot of people thought that this was a neat solution to the problems that had emerged, the problems of pollution, of siltation, uh, you know, the jamming up of drains with, uh, with bottles, pot plastic and all that sort of stuff, and the oil spills, etc. This could all be conveyed, it could all be changed by the introduction of these neat concrete banks. This was a common, uh, a common thing done at the time. This is a kind of engineering modernism which would solve these uh, problems of, of streams in urban areas. We'll go on to the next one, please. Also upstream, look at Cup and Saucer Creek at flood time in 1901. And it's a raging torrent. Um, admittedly, that's a, a, you know, because there's a lot of water flowing, that gives a very strong image that it's a kind of uh, Niagara Falls. It wasn't quite that, but it, it was a natural feature compared with what has, has subsequently happened to it. Look what the next slide of what it looks like in the 1930s. So a cup and saucer drain, I call that. And that is what we, that's what we have today. Although there have been some changes uh, near, the, near the mouth of Cup and Saucer Creek to improve that situation. So concrete uh, engineering. Let's go on to the next. Uh, uh, now the timing of this, this, these changes to the river and the introduction of, of the channelizing and the other changes, including the coming of the uh, airport near the mouth of the river, uh, are important to any historian saying, when did these things happen? And if you look at this picture, you're looking at Mascot in 1939. You can barely make out in the right middle, you can see the runways, they crisscrossed. You can see four of the runways there, uh, back, yeah, 
Uh, you can see, you can actually see four of the runways there. We're actually five. There's an additional runway in there somewhere. And you can see the ship, the hangars and so forth. That was the airport. Above that, you can see the channel of the Cooks River flowing from right on your picture to the left, out and then into the Botany Bay south. You can see the, uh, the um, um, uh, Tower of Point uh, uh, wetlands to the south of that and looking, looking, looking south towards Cronulla and on your right, Brighton. Now, um, so that's what it looked like in 1939. The foreground, you can also see that there's an awful lot of market gardens. When I started doing research on this topic, this is one thing that struck me. The, the very recency of the presence of extensive agriculture in the Cooks River Valley and the huge importance of it for the economy of the city in the supply of uh, vegetables. Um, so if we go on to the next one, we'll also see um, uh, another image of, of, from, from uh, about the same time, 1937. That was with the opening of the then new bridge over, over Alexandra Canal, which has been canalized out of the old Shays Creek uh, in the 1890s. And the original bridge is the drawbridge, which you can see there, a little, little drawbridge before it had been taken down. And that's a rather rare photograph of that. Um, and the new bridge of 1937. And both of those bridges have now been, uh, one of the, Drawbridge is gone. The other bridge is still there, but there's another bridge to the uh, to the upper up up further, which is where the uh, West connects and all the new roadworks have gone in there. But if you look again, you'll see a lot of um, in the middle section. You'll see a lot of market gardens uh, in the uh, Rosebury uh, or uh, uh, Gardens Road in that uh, area there. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Now, um, the next one is significant because it's almost the same area, not quite. But it shows extensive industrialization um, and it's just a little bit upstream and uh, there's an awful lot of there there are there is a, um, oil uh, oil um, reserves at the bottom and then there are also all kinds of manufacturing uh, plants up the river now a lot of this went in in the 1930s and 1940s particularly in the 1940s world war ii industrial and ind industrialization more generally the alexander canal became a, a place of large-scale industrialization. And it um, caused huge pollution, heavy metal damage in the river, which still exists today. Okay, so there's huge changes go on in the late 1930s and the 1940s as a result of World War II industrialization. Next slide, please. Now, the other big change to the lower river, which follows from all of these things, is the airport. In the 1930s, there really wasn't a, there really wasn't much of an airport, as you can see from the previous illustration. And this one in 1930, 1947 shows you the existence of four of the runways uh, there. Um, and um, there are one, two, three. Well, actually, there are only four runways. I must have miscounted before. I thought there was five in that, but there's only four. Okay, so you can see where the old airport is, and you can see the course of the river. Down below there, below the, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, if we go back to the left, you can see Muddy Creek as well. And you can also see crossing Muddy Creek. If you go uh, back there, yeah, that's actually the sewer pipes, which come, come across there. It's important to point this out because I'm not sure it'll come out in the next illustration. Okay, so that, um, that went out to the uh, um, Malabar uh, Ocean outfall. Okay, you can see in the left-hand top side, you can see all the, all the dredging that's been done to the river and what a geometric uh, kind of appearance and quite a, quite a still appearance because you can just see the bridge there and uh, a line across the uh, canal there. Yeah, that's right. And um, that's where the dam was, right there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so that's still the state in 1947. Let's go on to the next one because we are running out of time. And there you can see it in 1953. And the, 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 um, Direction of the airport has been completely changed to make the east-west runway the main, main runway, and the uh, entrance to the river has been completely changed um, down, down to Kaima. So the river has been shortened, and if we go on to the next one, we shall see next what it looks like today. Okay, that's just to put you in uh, reorient if you've flown in over Sydney, you'll, you'll recognize that. And you can see the um, uh, Crooks River, but you can also see the Muddy Creek to, to the, uh, yeah, that's it, Muddy Creek right there. Um, and upstream, if we go to the right, you can see 
um, the uh, a little bit upstream further, and I think that is yeah, that's where the dam was there, and that's where the Princess Highway uh, connection is. Okay, next one, please. We're just about out. I'm uh, just about finished. Okay, West Botany uh, is what it looked like in 1886, and in the middle of that you can see the swamp and you can see the muddy creek. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, in the uh, upper part of Yorks. Yeah, there, round right about there, south of there, yeah. That's right, round right about there. And, okay, next one. We can see what it looked like in 90, if we can see the next. Ooh. Okay, canalization had occurred there by the mid 1930s. You can see Muddy Creek again, which has been turned into a kind of boat, boat harbor. And above that, you can see where the sewer, sewer was, was put over the, um, over, the, over the Muddy Creek, but the river was still the same. That's 1937, mid-1930s, and Muddy Creek was canalised. Next one. Next one, please. Okay, and that's what it looks like more or less today. And, of course, there's, that's not the entrance of the... That is the entrance of the Cooks River now, and the Muddy Creek ends right at that, right at that point here. Yeah. Okay, now I think that's probably the last slide that I wanted to show you. Go on to the next one. Oh, no, connecting the local and the go. Well, that's something I do in this book. Cooks River after 1938, and what I call engineering modernism. Here it is in uh, in the upper Cooks River Valley. Uh, see the slot in the middle and the completely canalised uh, uh, course of the river. Um, go on to the next one, Los Angeles River. And Los Angeles River has exactly the same uh, thing, and it was also done at exactly the same time. So in the book, I explain how this is a sort of transnational or international kind of uh, engineering modernism, which informed the way that rivers were transformed in the 20th century. Um, and the, there are some enormous parallels between the Los Angeles River and the Cooks River after 1938. Also in the rectification of the damage done, which is going on still today. Um, let's go on beyond that to the next one. Uh, just skip that one. Yeah, skip that one. That's just another engineering modernism. Okay, now behind this was the idea of improvement uh, and uh, the Cooks River Valley Improvement League, 1908 and reformed 1924, and then the Cooks River Valley Association. Uh, reg revegetation since the 1980s and ec ecological re uh, restoration are themes that come out in my book, which I can't talk about here today. We're just not, we just don't have enough time. So if we go on to the next one, I'm not sure, if there, is there one more? Should be. Okay. Now this comes from six maps to a very useful site, which I can I, I can uh, answer questions about, but it's very useful because it shows you where things were at in 1943. And on that map, you can see the concreted Cooks River, and you can see where the concreting actually ended up there in the left-hand corner, uh, not quite there, there, yeah, right there. And if you look north a little bit up from that, you can see where the uh, natural stream is. And if you look downstream of it, you can see that they've changed the downstream as well. Uh, the course of it, go up from that, and you'll see where the original course, yeah, there, that's the original course. If you follow that curve around, that was the original course, you see. So you can see the way they um, they concreted it, okay? Now, if you go, the uh, big hole in the top left-hand corner is what's now called Dean Reserve, um, the Dean Reserve, which was a brick pit in the, 19, in the 1930s. Uh, there are brick pits up and down the valley. Okay, so six maps are just a very useful site for trying to check out what these things were like in 1943. And you'll notice there's not very much vegetation. The vegetation, excuse me, the vegetation has come subsequent to this. It's been reintroduced, it's been renaturalized, if you want to put it that way, since that time. I think we might stop there. Um, that really, oh, that really gives you a pretty good idea of what's uh, the, the main changes that have gone on. Okay, thank you very much.